you might have noticed the title of this program. It was called Tiny Troublemakers. And I was just telling Dick a story that goes along with this. You're probably wondering what a tiny, a tiny troublemaker is. Well, this tiny troublemaker does make a lot of trouble, and that's why we have the title selected that we're using here. But Dick, there was a story about a young man in China hmm. that spread a lot of gossip, said a lot of mean things about the wise old man that lived in his village. And the young man started feeling really guilty about it. And so he decided that he needed to go apologize to the old man, the wise old man of the village. And he went up and knocked on the wise old man's door. And he, he said to him, he said, I'm really sorry for you know, all the malicious things I've said about you to some of the neighbors and things. And the wise old man said, that's fine, I forgive you. But in this process of forgiveness, I'd like you to do one favor for me. And the young man said, well, what is that? What would you like me to do? He said, please take this. And the man gave him a, a cloth sack full of feathers. He said, please take it up onto the mountain and cast these feathers into the wind. <laughs> and the young man thinking, well, since he's a wise old man, and he's the, the wise man of the village, that maybe this is part of a ceremony or something in the forgiveness process. He didn't know. Yeah. So he went up in the mountain, climbed all the way up there. He got into the wind. And he took this bag full of feathers, and feathers floated every different direction. And then he went down to the, the wise old man and said, <laughs> sir, he said, I did what you told me. I cast the feathers in every direction in the wind. And the wise old man smiled and said, I may forgive you, but now I want you to go pick up all the feathers. Oh, yeah. And what he was saying was this. He is saying that I can forgive you for what you said, but what you said will be like those feathers, and they will continue to float every direction, and they're irretrievable. Irretrievable. Mm -hmm. As you were telling that story, I remembered this little saying, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. Yeah, you believe Nothing that. Nothing <laughs> could be further <laughs> from the truth. I agree. Uh, sticks and stones can break bones, but they will heal. But as, as you've told in that story, the damage that comes from ill-spoken or wrong-spoken words is forever and has huge implications. In fact, the book of James has some really interesting things to say about the tongue. It's got a, because the little troublemaker that we're talking about, the, the tiny troublemaker, the, the is words, this little This is where the words come out. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and in fact, there's a large part of a, of a whole chapter, mm -hmm. chapter three, that's dedicated to that. Why don't we take turns uh, going down sure. through that mm -hmm. and see how it goes. My brethren, be not many masters, knowing that we shall receive the greater condemnation. For in many things we offend all. If any man offend not in word, the same is a perfect man and able also to bridle the whole body. Isn't that incredible? Because sometimes we think of, you know, the perfect Christian life is, is, is something great big. Oh, a guy that has his appetite under control or has his, has his anger under control, but we don't realize that sometimes we're talking <laughs> about... Uh, behold, we put bits, now it's going to use illustrations, we put bits in the horses' mouths uh, that they uh, may obey us, and we turn about their whole body. Mm, and I like this next one. Behold, also the ships, which though they be so great, that they are driven of fierce winds, and yet they are turned about with a very small helm, whithersoever the govern listeth. And here James then makes his point. He said, even so the tongue is a little member and boasteth great things. And then he goes back to illustration again. Behold how great a matter a little fire kindleth. Ah, oh, and boy, I've seen more than one fire kindled by the use of the words that we speak. And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. So is the tongue among our members, that it defileth the whole body, and setteth on fire the course of nature, and it is set on fire of hell. For of every kind of beast, and of birds, and of serpents, and of things in the sea, is tamed, and has been tamed of mankind. But the tongue can no man tame. It is an unruly evil full of deadly poison. Well, that sounds kind of discouraging. The tongue can't even be tamed. I mean, we can tame all kinds of wild beasts and such, but we can't tame the tongue. It seems that way. And you know, uh, it, as I got to thinking about the implications, and this is what our program is obviously about, where does the tongue uh, and the words that we speak do the first damage? I say at home. What, what affects our home relationship between husbands and wives, between parents and children, between children and parents, if it isn't the words we speak? Absolutely. And as the scripture says, it says it can't be tamed by us. It can't be tamed. But praise God, I believe God can help us to tame this tongue. And in the home situation, if there is any place where we need to learn to have 
the Holy Spirit come into our lives to tame our tongues. It's in the home. What the way that we deal with our kids. I don't know how many times, Dick, I've, I've said things and I go to bed at night and I look back and say, why did I say that? You know, I remember a statement that was on the outside of a, a door when I used to work at a radio station. It said, please engage brain before sticking mouth in gear. <laughs> and as a parent, it's so easy to... Uh, how many times have we gone to our children and, and they've done something wrong and the little kids and we say, how many times have I told you not to do that? And the kids sit there shaking, you know, oh, yeah. and we're not thinking about, we're not thinking about what we're saying. And, and sometimes it's, it's not just the, the words, it's, it's, it's the tone. I don't know if this is true or not. Someone told me that, that dogs react not, not to the word as much as they react to the sound. Yeah, intonation. The intonation. Mm -hmm. And so, and so their, voca their vocabulary is, is an intonation. You know, how many times, uh, and I, this sounds like I'm, I'm talking about it's everybody else's problem but my own. Have you ever been in a shopping center and there's a poor l little frustrated mother in there and, and you know. I've seen it more than once. <laughs> junior Junior's doing something that he shouldn't do. And that mother talks to that child in a way she wouldn't talk to anybody else in the store. You see, which, which brings up another question. Why do we talk to people we love uh, the way we do when we wouldn't think of talking to other people mm -hmm. that way? Yeah, it reminds me of an illustration. I, I, I mentioned this before, but uh, my wife and I were having an argument at the breakfast table, and we were getting hotter and hotter, and as we were getting hotter and hotter and discussing things, and we were saying unkind things to each other, because let's face it, a lot of times we, we say the things we do based on our feelings and our emotions. We spontaneously just let whatever is inside just pour out, and it can be really nasty what pours out. And as we were arguing, the kids were slouching down farther and farther yes, yes, at the yes, table, yes, yes, and yes. all of a sudden the telephone rang. And it's amazing, oh, it's amazing how <laughs> I, I walked over to, to the telephone and here we I were in know. the middle of this argument. Hello, is it, why is it there such sanctifying power oh, in the telephone? Oh, come on, you know? oh, brother. <laughs> and I, I started talking with this brother and unfortunately this situation was, as he said, Jeff, he said, I need someone to talk to. My wife and I have been having marriage problems <laughs> and I, we're thinking well, about I've getting a divorce. <laughs> and I was like, don't talk to me, brother. <laughs> but, you know, I just said, Lord, you know, forgive me for my unkind words I was speaking to my wife today. You know, I've thought to myself, oh, what would our homes be like? Uh, if we uh, if if we just talk kindly to each other, you know, not only do we uh, do we cut each other, we we actually call each other names. We'll say, "You dummy, you idiot, you crazy, you lazy, or, you stupid," or worse than that. Yeah, well, you're you're being very kind, but of course we would be taken off the air if we went into <laughs> the vernacular that's used no. sometimes in homes and in Christian homes. And I've had young people come to me and. Uh, they basically confided with me privately that the reason that they're so turned off to church and Christianity is because of the, the words that are spoken at home by parents who get up in front of church and they put on a good show. Right, they right. say the right things and they can be articulate and they, they can give the right answers in, in a Sabbath school class or in a Sunday school class, depending on what church they go to. But at home, you know, here a family is on the way to church and they're all dressed up and and they're fighting in the car. You stupid, shut up, I'll, I'll slap your face. And, and, and then they pull into the, in, into, the, into the parking lot and then suddenly everything, becomes everything changes. <laughs> you see. I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. Hello, sister, um, happy Sabbath. And all really, that. we should be laughing at that. It's, it's, not, it's not funny, I mean. But we've got to laugh at ourselves in, in a way, as you say, it's not funny, but we've got to get serious. Mm -hmm. Have you ever noticed that um, how often, at least I've noticed this in my ministry, that, that uh, when a divorce is in the works, that one or the other of the, of the spouses will say, I never loved him or I never loved her anyway. And, and, and what I think is happening is that, is that when we speak cruelly to each other and unkindly to each other, unless we make that right, Jeff, unless we make that right, that goes into a data bank boy. Mm -hmm. and, and see, pretty soon there gets to be more and more in the file, and then finally one day it all busts out, and then it reminds us, hey, I've never liked this guy from the very beginning, or I've never liked yeah. this girl. And, and a good illustration of that is that our words are like bricks and mortar. Um, an unkind thing is said and it's chalked away in our subconscious mind or our conscious mind and in the recesses of our, our conscious mind and it's like a brick is put in place and then more unkind things are said, something that's a dig, something that is a reminder of our failures, something that is, is uh, letting us know that we're not measuring up to our expectations of our spouse and another brick is put in place and another brick is put in place until this wall is finally Absolutely. built that creates Absolutely. a barrier to where people are living two separate lives in the same home and they're completely uh, 
isolated from each other, even though they live in the confines of the same home. And it all started with the, with words, the words that they spoke, the unkind things, uh, uh, not looking at the good of the other person, but always looking at the negative of the other person and bringing that out and emphasizing that and saying it over and over and over. These days we talk, well, you know, the church needs a revival and renewal, and, and you know, there's so much backbiting and there's things going on in the church. And, and, and it's occurred to me, oh, why not? Why not? The church is only reflecting what's going on at home. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, the church really is in good shape. The church doesn't have any problems because if we look at the church as just being a building, it's just empty and it's empty <laughs> six days a week and it's just sitting there. It's doing fine by itself. But it's when all the people start coming in that you start having the problems. And those people are nothing more than a reflection of what's happening in their homes. And is it any wonder that when there's bickering and fighting and, and issues going on in a home that all of a sudden when you deal with church, church elections and situations in the church, that people are bickering and fighting and showing jealousy and, and speaking unkindly about each other in churches. I, I've had people come up to me in different churches where I've been speaking they say you know what's happening in our church and they start telling me all this stuff and I start thinking about what we read in James and also as we go into first in second Corinthians you know talking about the backbiting and gossiping that goes let on. me just say and I was about to say as you were talking about some of these things in church I was gonna say Jeff it's not new. <laughs> it's not new. Apparently, it goes all the way back. Uh, why don't you read that text? Uh, in, you know, in I, first of all, I just like to say that Paul preached to the Corinthians, and God blessed. And as we study the book of Acts, we see how the Holy Spirit caused the early Christian church to flourish and to grow, and thousands were baptized in a day. And we like to emphasize that, but sometimes we don't focus in on the fact that they were people. And wherever there's people, there's problems. And they had to work through issues, just like we have to work through issues. And Paul had to sometimes rebuke them Absolutely. for the issues that they went Absolutely. through. In 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 20, it says, For I fear lest when I come, talking about his next visit mm -hmm, to the Corinthians, mm -hmm. I shall not find you such as I would, and that I shall be found unto you such as ye would not. In other words, he's saying that I come to you and things, circumstances now have changed from what they were before. Lest there be debates, envyings, wraths, strifes, backbiting, whisperings, <laughs> swellings, or in other words, swelling is an old big test. Big egos. Is, yeah, having a big ego, or tumults, or causing confusion, confusion amongst the body. And Paul was warning them, don't get involved with this. Understand how the devil works and watch out for what you use, this little tongue that James talks about, how you, the words you use in the church setting. Well, now what about this word debate? Uh, I think you were saying, I'm going to, I'm going to tell the world uh, that, that, that you said to me uh, it, it, you know, at the house uh, the other day, you said, I don't think I've ever found anybody that I agree with in, in everything. <laughs> now, That's now, true. Now, now, now the question is, should we expect that everybody's going to agree with us? I say no. I, I, have, no. I have a brother who is a Christian of the same faith. He's an Adventist just like myself. He's a brother in flesh and blood. We agree on almost everything. Almost everything. <laughs> <laughs> but you see, this brings up the, uh, the question of debates. Knowing that we don't agree on everything, uh, should we debate then? Should we just go and go and go? Because these debates can cause hard feelings. See, I've mm -hmm. come to the conclusion. By the way, uh, I noticed that your hair is getting, getting a little gray, but when it <laughs> finally gets as gray as mine, see, then, then you really, you've been around. You know what I've noticed? I've That's noticed it. that that a debate uh, can be worthwhile only to the point where we see it goes nowhere now. Mm -hmm. And then maybe we stop and we say, I think it's time to agree to disagree. It's talking about agreeing, we need to take a quick break because <laughs> our time is I going agree. by so fast. I agree. We agreed on that. You're watching Layman Ministries Crosstalk and we'll be back in just a moment. Layman Ministries has a global outreach. Just a few of the activities we're involved with include sponsoring a weekly Tamil TV ministry broadcast from South India, distributing literature in remote countries of Eastern Europe, Russia, Nepal, India, China, and the Philippines. We sponsor lay workers, Bible workers, and pastors in their own countries, as well as being involved with outreach to indigenous peoples in the Philippines and deep in the interior of China. Well, Dick, right before the break, we were talking about a lot of negative things that were happening in the, the home and in the church and the early Christian church, the warnings that Paul gave to the people in Corinthians, and we were applying that to a modern day setting, but let's switch over to the positive side, you know, of things. Uh, um, 
let's look at how maybe we could use our words a little more wisely in the conversations that we have and the conversations that we don't have. Let's start with the family, for instance. Well, let me tell you something I've learned. Before the break, I was telling you about the advantage of having white hair. You know, I tell people when I preach, I said, when you get white hair, you really get smart, see? Hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> yes, That's thank one you. of those little words. Th yeah, thank you very much. <laughs> uh, here's what I have noticed, and I use this ridiculous illustration. Supposing, now this would never happen, supposing my, my wife Betty comes home from work one day and she says, oh no, it's not you again, ugly. Man, I'm fed up. I'm t you know, or it says something just completely off the wall. I've come to the conclusion that though those words were cutting and were terrible, they were awful, really nothing happens, Jeff, until I respond. In fact, I've seen situations where words like that have been thrown out and you can kind of look around the room and everybody's in suspense like, what is going to come next? by that reaction of what happens that comes next can set the whole, That's it. The whole That's it. scenario, what's going to take place for the next couple hours or even for... And, and, so, and so what I've learned, I've learned you know, to give my family members what we, you know, uh, what we sometimes call a bad hair day. Mm -hmm. In other words, if somebody says something to you at home that really just doesn't sound right, it's not fitting, why not just don't respond? Why not mm -hmm. just let it go? In fact, maybe even change the subject. You know, there's something inherent to human nature, though, that we have a tendency to dwell on the negative. I remember one time a lady came up to me, and we got to talking, and somebody else's name came up in the conversation. And I said, oh, I know so-and-so. I mentioned the person's name. And then I went on to say, but. I said, I know them, and they're a nice person, but. Why is it that we always add buts to our conversation? And then I said something kind of derogatory about that person. And this lady looked at me, and she is shocked. And she said, well, Jeff, when I brought up your name to that person, she only said good things about you. And is, is that when you sunk through the oh, floor? Oh, and I thought, I did it again. You know, I said something negative. And why is it that we're so quick to see the negative and speak about the negative? Why is it that when we talk about somebody, he's a great guy, but, or he's, she's a wonderful person, but, and then we always have to conclude with something negative. Let me make a confession. And, uh, you know, uh, confession is good for the soul. I can remember back when I was a very young minister uh, that the conference president, the, you know, the boss, he said, Dick, uh, what do you know about so-and-so? I want to tell you, to have the boss ask you when you're like 23 years old about somebody. Now's your chance I to feel, say something. I felt, brother. <laughs> but, but, but then, and I can remember doing this consciously, that if I said something good about that person, you know, I would be, that would mean I'd be shallow. I, you know, in other words, I don't know anything. And so I thought, I've got to say something here that would be a little bit critical to let him know I have perception. And, and I, thought, I thought afterwards, now I don't remember what it was or how important it was, but I thought, that's ridiculous. Mm -hmm. It goes right along with a, a Bible verse in Proverbs 17, verse 9. It says, He that covereth a transgression seeketh love, but he that repeateth a matter separateth very friends. So in other words, somebody you know something about somebody that's maybe not the best for you go around telling everybody else about that? What you're doing is you're dividing friendships. And it says in Proverbs 26, 22, it says, The words of a talebearer are as wounds. Have you ever been wounded? You know, we think wounds sometimes come by somebody hitting you or something, but some of the most serious wounds I've received are the bad things that someone said about me to somebody else. Can I tell you something else that I've learned with my white hair? Sure. I respect uh, the wise old man. <laughs> <laughs> I've learned this. <laughs> when you talk about, uh, you know, uh, tail bearing, when you've been around a while, you learn never tell anybody anything that you don't want the world to know. Mm -hmm. You know, we have this illusion that we're going to say to somebody, you know, I'm going to tell you something, but, but, but don't tell anybody. Do you promise not to tell anybody? I don't believe that anymore. I'm, a, I'm at the place in my life where I know that anything I tell anybody, I have effectively told everybody. everybody. I think we ought to understand that. Yeah, there's an old saying that says, uh, 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 Gossip can go around the world while truth is still putting its boots on or something like that. <laughs> you know, I work with a person that has a, an ability that I think is quite unique. Is that person, in the years I've worked with this person, they've never, I never remember them saying derogatory things about anybody. And that's caused me to have a lot of respect for that person. But there's been times where I've asked that person, you know, something serious about a situation with other employees and stuff. And if that person who never says anything bad about anybody says one thing that's even a hint that maybe there's a problem, I listen. You know, and there is a time that we have to talk about things in a negative sense, you know, like we're interviewing people for jobs or things. We have to look at things realistically and deal with things in a realistic way. But that's something that's always really impressed me. <coughs> but, but, but aren't we talking about, uh, when we talk about the damage being done, I impugning character. Uh, we're talking about impugning character. Uh, I think you and I were talking one day, supposing that there's somebody that was uh, working in a business and they embezzled money. 
and then later we're talking about having a treasurer, an accountant for a business, and, and you know, to say, well, you know, he embezzled money is not really backbiting or gossip, I, I, is it? No, it's saying the facts for what they are Absolutely. in a situation when it needs to be said. And so there, once again, there's, there's that balance there. You know, in this whole situation too in the, in the church, we recently did a study in our church to try to find out how our church could be more effective and it's, it's inter, interacting with the church members and interacting with the community. And one of the things that we noticed about, and maybe this is true in a lot of churches, is that the people there were driven spiritually to want to serve God. But as far as unity in the church, we were really weak because we were very independent. Mm -hmm. And the one thing that came out more than anything was the lack of of appreciation and affirmation from fellow church members. This can carry over into the home too. But how often do we, at church somebody does something or even in the home somebody does something that we acknowledge that, we see the positive side of it and we say, you know, you did a really good job, I really appreciate that. You're touching my heart because as I look back on raising my children, I think I, think I was more of a referee. In other words, I was actually waiting to tag them out and looking back on it, why didn't I? thank them and appreciate them Be because I don't think anybody improves, uh, really improves, fundamentally improves when they're being uh, put down yeah. and when they're being cut. But people really want to do better. Mm -hmm. And, 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 and when, they, when they're told that they did something good, you know what it does is it encourages them to want to keep going, keep trying and doing better. You know, especially I think that, that this works with husbands and wives because you see, we tend, works with everybody, we mm -hmm. tend to, say, you know, to say, well, honey, you shouldn't do this, honey, you shouldn't do that. I know, you know from a man's point of view, that, that, that I, I, I covet, I crave the respect of my wife. You know, if, if she says something good to me, uh, you know, that's better than standing at the door and having 500 people say it was a good sermon. Mm -hmm. I remember uh, working at a job, and I think this is true whether you're working on a construction crew or working as a custodian or working at a law firm or a hospital, wherever you're at. For some reason, the people that are the lower down people, you know, the, the ones that are uh, we had different slang words I probably shouldn't use yeah, on yeah, no, a program, yeah. Never mind. The, Never the mind. common laborers were always complaining about the, the, the foreman or the administrator, the boss, and I wouldn't do it that way. And I remember this one job I had, um, the boss came in and he was a super nice guy. And he said, you know, we need to do this, we need to do that, and we need to get this done. And, and then he left. And these two guys sit down, got out a cigarette, started drinking coffee, and they said, well, if I was the boss, I wouldn't do it that way. I think it's stupid how he asked me to do this and that. And while they were doing that, I started, started doing what the boss asked me to do. And those guys came over and said, what do you think you're doing anyhow? And I said, you know, if you guys would quit fighting amongst yourself about what the boss, you know, picking on the boss and stuff, I said, if you just did what he asked you to do, it could be already half done. You know, a, a thing I learned some years ago, <clears throat> somebody uh, uh, said, don't remind a person of the obvious. And, and, and let me explain what I mean. Supposing that your child, or, or it could be anybody, let's say they're carrying a, you know, a bowl of, of, of something or other, and you say, look out, you know, you could drop that bowl, and uh, sure enough, they <laughs> slip and they drop the bowl. What you don't do is say, see, I told you to be more careful, uh, because that's the obvious. If a person makes an obvious mistake, and I think that this is what we would want to, one of the things we want to remember from this program, if a person's made an obvious mistake, don't continue to put them down. Don't just mm -hmm. grind them down. That's the time to step in and to help them to get their selves back together again. That goes along, Dick, so well with Psalms 141, verse 3. It says, set a watch, O Lord, before my mouth, keep the door of my lips. He's saying, Lord, please help me to think about what I'm going to say. Tell me what to say and when to say it, and sometimes not to say something at all. Because like you say, if it's obvious, there's nothing that needs there's to be said. There's nothing that needs to be said. But when you say, uh, say nothing at all, uh, remember I mentioned that if somebody says something that, that really doesn't uh, uh, merit a response, d don't say it. This is one thing uh, that I'm learning these days. And that is sometimes the best words to say are not words at all. Mm -hmm. Silence is golden. Yeah, sometimes now, people just need to unload. And just by listening to them, I know and talking to people with problems on the phone, just to, I don't really have the answer to the problem, no. but letting them unload and talk and talk and I encourage them to pray about it and such. And then when they get done, they say, oh, I felt so good talking with you about this. It, you know, you know I, I found when some people come to me and they say, Pastor Ophel, I'd like your counsel. They don't really mean that. <laughs> they mean I'd like somebody to listen to me. Yes, uh, exactly. Uh, and. Uh, I want to learn. I want to learn how to do that. By the way, um, in this same book of James, you know, that we read out of mm -hmm. when we began the program, there's another text that says, uh, be swift to hear and slow to speak. Uh, so, it, so, it's, so it's not just 
knowing the words to say or not to say, but it's knowing when to say them. Be swift to hear. What would our marriages be like? What would the church be like if we were just better listeners? We started out by reading the book of James, and it said that the, no man can bridle this thing. But the truth is, God can bridle this oh, thing. Oh, absolutely. Because when we ask God to come into our heart and the Holy Spirit reigns in our hearts, that Holy Spirit can give us power and can give us wisdom to know when to speak and not to speak. And I think of what David prayed in, in Psalms 39, verse 1. And, and I, talking about David, said, I will take heed to my ways that I sin not with my tongue. I will keep my mouth with a bridle mm -hmm. while the wicked is before me. And so David is saying that, you know, we might not be able to bridle our tongues, but God in us can put a bridle on us so that our tongues will not do the damage that it can do. And some of the most terrible things that can happen in a relationship are not sometimes the physical things that happen. I mean, there's a lot of physical things that happen that are really terrible and shouldn't happen, but um, the things that happen mentally by the use of the tongue are just as damaging sometimes as uh, the uh, physical abuse that is so common in our society. What would our homes be like? And, and I think this is the challenge uh, for those who have uh, sh shared this program with us. Uh, I, I, wouldn't we want to challenge all of us? Look into your life. Look into your life at home. Look into your uh, church life. Look into your life on the job. And, and, and now you can say, well, I sure wish my wife had been watching this program or <laughs> I, you know, I wish my, my boss would see this. No, I, 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 not my mother, my sister, but it's me, oh Lord, not my brother, standing in the need of prayer. Mm -hmm. so, so I would hope that, that as we contemplate the impact of words, let's don't think of the other person's words necessarily because mm -hmm. I don't know that, 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 I can, uh, that I can control how another person speaks, but I definitely get to control the way I respond mm -hmm. in the words like that I that speak. Like that sign on that door at the DJ's office at the radio station, uh, please engage mind before sticking mouth in gear. That is such wise <laughs> counsel because if we would stop and think before we speak, how much less damage could be done. In Titus 3, 2 it says, to speak evil of no man, to be no brawlers, but gentle, showing all meekness unto all men. And that's my prayer, is that God Amen. will help us to do that. Philippians 4, 8, you know, it talks about whatsoever things are good, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of a good report. If there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think upon Amen. these things. Amen. Our time is up. We hope that you've learned a lesson about this little tiny troublemaker, and we pray that God will give you the power to bridle your tongue, to be careful about the words that you speak to others. If you'd like to be in contact with this ministry, you could do so by contacting us at Layman Ministries. That's 414 Zapata Road, St. Mary's, Idaho, 83861. Or you can call us on our toll-free number at 1-800-245-1844. You can also contact us on the World Wide Web at www.lmn.org.